was like, she said, I'm not, I'm not off the ballot for presidency. I said, come on now. Now, I've, I've met her a couple of times before. I'm like, well, come on now. You know, they're not going to let you be president. Yeah. Wow. Of course, I got the of maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. I'm only, I am five foot nine. She's about two inches shorter than me with heels on. <laughs> she got, she has serious Napoleon complex. Cause she would tell somebody, Mm-mm, sit down. I saw her do it. <laughs> I've seen her tell people to sit down. And wow. you just you kind of chuckle. Well, I hope she tempers some of that now. Cause every, like you said, everything's going to be scrutinized. Everything. Yeah. I already, um, my uh, one of my teammates, he's already been watching Fox News, and the first thing they brought up was the debate when she went after well, Biden on the bus. And I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. everything be used against you. Mm-hmm. They're gonna run that on on a loop. <laughs> so I see Mr. Rico Jackson. Oh, hey, how y'all doing? There you are. Uh-huh. Hey, how are you? I can't complain. I can't complain. I, I appreciate I, I y'all mean, coming I'm on for me. I'm get you to the office. You can see the chat on the side. There's the other chat on the side. I probably have to turn it up like that. I don't ever see the chat on my um, phone. Yeah, if I do it like that, then I won't see the picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, okay, okay. That's how I'm gonna be able to talk to you in case you got a phone call. Don't worry about it. Okay. I, I run around here. Do it that way. All right. Let me know when you're ready to get started. All right, let me hit them up one more time. Okay. Let me see what the hold up is. Y'all give me one second. But um, Nancy, I wanted to mention to you, I came across a Facebook post and it was so good. It said, empowered women, empowered women, empower women. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic. Maybe she on now. Let me call him one more time. He said he was getting ready. Hey. Hi. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm just not getting there. I, I went on my Facebook page on my, uh, and I went to Messenger. Uh, okay. Okay, it's a new message request. Okay. Raheem and, okay. StreamYard browser. So you entering the broadcast studio? Yeah, enter the broadcast studio. Okay, let, let me uh, see if I... Uh, give me your number and let me see if I can do this on my phone. I'd rather really do it on the phone than because I, I know this mic is not up on this thing. So what's your phone number, Rico? Oh, well, if you, um, you, you can log in through your phone. Huh? Do it through do it through your messenger on your phone. Yeah, that's what I'm about to do. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you if you just do it through your message on your phone, it ought to come straight through. Okay. All right. Let me get off from you. All right. All right. Goodness gracious. She's supposed to be the mail, huh? Oh, man, this live. Oh, my goodness. You just said that? <laughs> Let me get this off here, man. How can you cancel this shit? Don't ask me. I Damn it. I know one thing. I just deleted it. Goodness gracious, it's too late, man. God, oh, man. I can't you believe it. Just... Yeah, I'm live already and I said that. I'm sorry, Miss McQuarrie. I'm sorry, man. That's what people do when they all of y'all talk on. <laughs> I might need to get off this live stream. I'm going to go ahead and get going, man. Why? Washington, Robert E. Lee, um, Jefferson Davis, Mitch McConnell, um, Clinton, we all are related in some kind of way. Wow. So officially in my family, and especially in Virginia, I'm known as the black sheep of the family because I'm the only one who's ever run for office. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are they waiting for? Why do we need to the run? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 400 years later, we should have been had a woman um, congressional representative, a black woman. So if I had won this year or last year, I would have been the first woman of color to represent Virginia on Capitol Hill. Wow. In 2020, that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It's like you get tired of seeing, you know, the more we advance, we want to stop saying you're the first of this, the first of that. To me, there's no there's no real pride in that. It's just a reality. Um, mm -hmm. I remember being in law school and um, asked by a white administrator, why was I not proud to be one of eight blacks in a class of like two hundred something people, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah we go ahead, man. I, yeah, yeah. This, I, it ain't it ain't supposed, it ain't supposed to be this difficult. Ain't, well, we man, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know, man, but we get rolling. <laughs> okay, we're right yeah. now, right, Fancy. <laughs> we're ready to do it. <laughs> yeah, we about we about to get started because I don't know what. The, I can't understand what the hold up is on the other end. Yeah, that hold a lot of buttons you got to click, but like two or three buttons, and then you, you on. Welcome, welcome to Koblo's Wil the show called The Wilson. This is my second broadcast, and um, I wanted to thank, thank everybody for showing up today. This show is mainly based on trying to get information out to the community that we should actually be more concerned with. A lot of the things and many things that we aren't really participating in or really talking about that we should talk about. 
And it's just not in one community in this in in it, that this is happening. This is in a lot of communities with our people. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to bring forth some attention about the political season. Right now, everybody is really in a run right now to get elected or re-elected or challenged. And so I wanted to bring different perspectives from women of color that are that that are involved in politics and talk about some of the things that they encounter, some of the um, I'm gonna say the obstacles and you know just everyday things that they have to go through realizing the position that they're in. And then I have Mr. Tim, Timothy Raglan below. He's um recently, what well, I think has been a, not quite a year, right at a year, he was elected mayor of Talladega, Alabama. Everybody knows about Talladega. That's where the Talladega 500 is. And um maybe we'll have a few more people called in that's involved in politics, but I, I mainly want to give us some exposure and um, bring some light to things that we should talk about, things that you know about that the, the general public in our community is not aware of. So first I want to say welcome to Vanji Williams. She's a, from Virginia. I want to say thank you to Miss Patsy Austin Gatson. She's um actually she's in a runoff today. <laughs> but no, district no runoff. Oh, no runoff? Okay. No, I won the primary by fifty nine point four forty percent of the vote. All right. <laughs> No, no, another success. <laughs> District Thank attorney. You. And then, like I said once before, we have Mr. Tim Timothy Raglan, Mayor Timothy Raglan of Talladega, Alabama, home of the Talladega, Talladega 500. And um, <laughs> further on, let's, I, I like to talk to um Virginia. Virginia, she's run for Congress. I'd like to get a little insight on. You know, um, what drove you to run for Congress and what are some of the things that you have to go through that, uh, that you think we might need to know more about? So, I, this, I ran twice. I ran in 2018 and ran in 2020. Something that most people don't realize is that we as black women, we are often the last to get a dollar in, fund, in fundraising. We're often the last to get the publicity. Because most people don't understand that a black woman comes at a different perspective. We come from a perspective of conservatism. Although we're Democrats 99% of the time, we are very conservative. We don't believe in what most people say, I am pro-choice, but I don't believe in abortion. Right. Understand, that's two different things. But it's not my choice or anybody else's choice to make that decision. But as a woman, comments that I heard were, and, and Patsy, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so you for, you're pro-choice. So don't most black women get abortions and they just want to use them for birth control? No. It is not us out here getting abortions at, at great numbers. Hate to tell you that. It's just not us. A, we don't have the capital to do it. B, we don't have a facility to do it. And C, most times, we're a little bit too proud to go in there and make that choice. Right. We're rather baby and fight through it and do the right thing and raise that child. We as black women come from a perspective, we run, I ran, I have six daughters. If I have a representative who doesn't see me as a person, but only as a color or as a Democrat, but not as a constituent of his town, it was time for me to step up and run. Right. So in 2018, I ran. And I came the closest to beating him or any Republican in our district since 19, ready for this, 76. I lost by 10 points. And I did that with less than a half million dollars. Mm. Every other congressional candidate in the state of Virginia had two, three, four, five, 18 million dollars. I ran that race because people understood I ran for heart and for truth, for justice, and it was for them. Right. So, you know, it was a tough run. And then in 18, we ran again. Well, sorry, 2020, we ran again. But COVID-19, I would have to say COVID-19 changed the dynamics of running a good grassroots door-knocking campaying because right. of uh, staying alive was more important. Um, having a daughter um, who has a special need uh, she has a condition called aspergillosis. COVID-19 will kill her. Mm -hmm. So in March, I locked down. And yes, people ask me, you didn't go to the Black Lives Pro-Choice, pro uh, uh, pro-life, what do you call it? 
Black Lives Matter marches. I'm black. I don't have to prove I'm black by going to the marches. But what I can do is work behind the scenes to get laws changed by the representatives I knew. And that is the difference between us and them. Yeah. I didn't go to a Black Lives Matter protest to, to make a statement. I stayed home and did the right thing. So running for office, that's what it's about. Right. And yeah, I'm going to do it again. I heard Everybody. that. We need that. We need that. You got to keep fighting. Keep pushing forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You know, I had a conversation earlier, and I say this quite a, quite often. It's really a hard place in the political atmosphere for a conservative black person. Because we have to choose between the lesser of two evils. A lot of stuff I don't agree with with the Democratic Party either. But at the same yeah. time, if I go with the Republican Party, I'm siding with white nationalists. It's like we're in between a rock and a hard place. Uh, how, what is it like for you guys being, because I'm pretty sure for you to be a politician and being a black person, you got to be somewhat conservative. You can't be, you know, you can be liberal, but, you know, in our shoes, our liberal is not the same as everybody else's liberal, I don't think. <laughs> so how is that for y'all? Cassie, you agree with me. That is perfectly said. I am yeah. a modern. Yeah. I am an independent by nature. Yes. Yet, I was told I wasn't progressive enough because I wouldn't say Medicare for all. Guess what? I believe that everyone in the country deserves Medicare, but I also have a plan to make it happen. But I don't like the term Medicare for all. Uh -huh. And nor do most of the people in my district. Or, um, um, oh, oh. Uh, Do we lose Manchin? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I, as a moderate black person, had to explain to several persons in, on the on the on the other simple. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to work for all of us. And when we when we go to Capitol Hill, we have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Their thing was, well, no, no, no. We progressives. We want to do it this way. You don't represent me. You think you know what we need in our community. You think you know what a black person needs in our community where I do. I'm right. in the community. Right. Right. And they don't understand that. Just like the young man who won on the primary, he won by 2,000 votes. Black people did not go for Bernie Sanders in this district. Black people are not really happy with AOC hmm. in our district. And now he's running on that platform in this district. And my fear is, while I think he's a great young man, I fear that if he doesn't start pointing his way to more central so we get those moderate conservatives to come our way on the Democratic side, the incumbent will win. I actually talked to his team earlier this week, and I told them. Oh, she broke up. Hey, we're going to keep it moving. Um, Patsy. Yes. What influenced you to want to become a district attorney in Gwinnett County? Well, Gwinnett County right now is one of the most diverse um, counties in the southeast. And we have everybody here. And the, demo the demographics have changed just so phenomenally that... Um, I feel it was time. It was time for someone to step up. The person, the incumbent I'm going against, he's a Republican. He's been in the office for 27 years with no opposition. So it's just time. It's time for change. Right. And um, I jumped in the race after much prayer and thought and conversations with my family about, do, do we want to do this on campaign trail now? since May of 2019. So it's getting ready to wrap up. So I'm just happy about it. Um, the primary was just wonderful in the sense that um, all 156 precincts in our county came my way. Mm -hmm. And I also bested the incumbent. He had no opposition in his race as a Republican, but I still got like 2,000 more votes than he did. Oh. So. We're ready to do it. I, <laughs> I think we're ready. That. I heard the, the universe seems like it's been working in a, in a, a different direction here lately. Um, yeah. Mr. Tim, you're a mayor of Talladega, Alabama. I don't know if you were the first black mayor, 
Uh, I assume you were, but being that we're neighbors, I'm in the neighboring city of you of Anniston, and um, we've had a majority black city for I don't know how long. It's been a long time that Anniston has been a majority black city, but our community didn't actually find, I'm going to say, the audacity or just to even see uh, with a vision that we could elect a black mayor. Or that, you know, we had a few people run before then, but in the sit as it, in the community, you didn't really hear too many citizens talk about that. How was it in Talladega getting the community motivated to come out and, and get you elected? Because I know that had to be a pretty solid job you had to do to get elected in Talladega. Um, you know, it was it was definitely a community effort. Uh, I won my 23 votes uh, in a runoff against an incumbent. Um, you know, it took a lot of, it, it was like I said, it was a community effort. It took a lot of help from uh, Talladega College, historically black college, college in our city. Um, we had I had not only support from black people, I had support from white people from every democratic demographic across our city. Um, you know, and the thing I think that made the difference was uh, messaging. Um, it was interesting that uh, Patsy that you said it's time for change. That was actually my platform. Uh, time for change. <laughs> it is. Um, and time was an acronym for technology, infrastructure, money, which is better uh, job opportunities, and education. Um, and so when you speak to people uh, about the real issues that are going on talk about things that are relevant to people's lives. Um, I think it's it's galvanizing and it helps to uh, obviously make history. Right, right. Well, tell me this. Um, what does it take? How much willpower does it take to actually take that step forward to put yourself on the line like that? Because, I mean, you know, a lot of people complain, many citizens complain, but they don't really make the effort to make to, to cause any change, to make a contribution to change. So, what really you know pushed you first off to make that decision to say, you know what, man, I'm I'm gonna put it on my back. I'm gonna put the weight of the of Talladega on my shoulders, and and we gonna go and do this on both sides of the tracks. Yeah, um, you know, I toyed with the idea in 2015, and I kind of psyched myself out and talked myself out of it. Um, but for your later for years later in 2019. It was time to decide if I was going to run, um, and as I drove around the city, I saw the same buildings that were being that were dilapidated and, and were in squalor in 2015 were the same way in 2019. The same potholes that were there in 2015 were there in 2019. Mm -hmm. People weren't proud to be from Talladega. Every time you saw Talladega on the news, it was something negative. Um, and I wanted to be the person that not just complained about it. I wanted to do something to help. So that's that's really why I, I ran. I wanted to. Help. Great, 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 Miss Gasson. Future District yes. Attorney Gasson, how's um the voter turnout with the people in our community in Gwinnett County? I mean, is it, is participation good amongst the, the black community and the brown community in Gwinnett County? Well, it's awesome because initially for the primary race, um, the Secretary of State sent out 6.4 million um, um, requests for absentee ballots. Because with COVID being a problem, that was a great move that was made to send out the um, the request, you know, so you can ask for absentee ballots to every voter in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I think that really pushed the um, participation of the voters in Gwinnett County. And that's why someone we know does not want uh, voting by mail. So um, it's really, it's really going to push people to know I have no excuse. I don't have to go wait in a line, you know, for five hours. I can vote by mail, by ballot. And I think that has really pushed the numbers way up. Yeah. Um, when Stacey Abrams ran for governor, she took Gwinnett County. And she took Gwinnett County with, I think it was 31,000 votes. When I took... Um, this race for the Democratic primary, I won by like 61,000 plus votes. So that just shows you people are really woke. They're listening. They're looking at who they want to put in office. And one thing, you know, I did interact with some of the young people doing the marches out here and they want change and they want it now. They want justice. They want it now. And it's time for it to happen. And any other excuse will not will not carry the day. There are no more excuses. Because I have two grandchildren in this county, a one-year-old and a two-year-old. 
And I don't want to see them having to deal with systemic racism, you know, in their lives. This is time for us to step up, you know, like John Lewis would say, get in some good trouble. Right. You know, right. we need that. We need to make it happen. And if people that are ready, I'm so sorry, you're going to be left behind. Exactly. But we need to be on the right side of history at this point and get get the job done all the way down the ticket. <laughs> and, not, and the one thing, other thing I noticed about this younger generation, too, they're not standing for anything that has, doesn't have any logic. They're not listening to just that's the way it's always been. Yes. That, that, that ain't flying no more because we've been putting up with the same stuff for too long. Like like uh, Mr. Ragland said, you're seeing potholes year after year after year, and dilapidation year after year after year, but then you got another side of town that looked like it came from another country, just progress all over the place. So they're not tolerating that. You know, it's, um, they're, they're waking up from from being submissive, I guess I, I you want to call it. But um, yes. How old the how was the turnout for you up in Virginia, Miss Williams? So it was pretty good this year. Um, but we've had a little bit of voter suppression issues going on. So I'm not sure if be consistent we have to be consistent too i got on um, the mayor from my hometown of house city alabama i'm gonna introduce her she's um from the second incorporated black city in the united states the first incorporated black city in alabama so i call it the mayor of the historic house city i'm proud <laughs> and so um tim knows about house city so i want to introduce her and um give her a chance to speak you know because she's well the city that that we're from, um, that progress and that that awakeness of voting participation hasn't really struck our communities yet. And you know, that's the way a lot of society works. Uh, trends, a lot of times trends will start off in big cities, big communities, and it takes a few years before it trickles down to the rural areas. And so now um to a certain extent, 
you have a movement going along, going along and coming along a little bit in our community, but it's very slow. You know what I'm saying? So um, I really, I'm really thrilled to have her on here too because she's coming from a perspective of actually trying to uplift the city, motivate the community, and keep it, make it sure that it survives throughout history because we have a heritage and a legacy that we we're trying our best to preserve. You know, and a lot of people in the United States won't pay attention to it, but we should because these small towns are very important too. So there you go, Miss Miss Al Miss Miss Alberta McCrory. I, I'm introducing you. You go ahead and take it from here. Okay, uh, Rico, and I want to thank you all so much for having me on your show today. Took a little time for me to get to you, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we're there. And I was just listening to the young lady, you know, talking about uh, those years since uh, slavery and the 400 year span that has uh, taken place. But uh, where we are right now in this community, I was just sharing with a young lady earlier that her father, who was on our council, on our city council, opted not to run again because one of his daughters, who's maybe in her 60s, told him, who's 82, that you are too old, you need to get out of the way and let the young people take over. And I said, you know, Dr. C.T. Vivian was about to celebrate his 96th birthday. Yes. And I don't hear anybody, I didn't hear anybody saying, you need to get out of the way and let the young people take over. They didn't say it about John Lewis because they know the commitment that those men uh, made to our struggle here in America. And one of the things right. that I was thinking about when you were talking about voting, sister, when I was in high school, my father nor my mother could vote. There were a few people in our city who did vote. And I'm happy to say, and Rico's father remembers that I was in the Selma Montgomery March. And he said he remembers that because he remembers the old people saying, hey, I've already went. And I <laughs> went, sister, because I went to Sunday school on Sunday and went to church. And my pastor was a Morehouse graduate. I had graduated from ITC, and he was very active with Dr. King and Andy Young and Julian Bond and John Lewis. And I tell people one day I answered the phone at his house, and it was Andy Young. Then the next call was telling Martin call call Martin King, and then somebody else called, and I said I thought I had died and gone to civil rights heaven to have all of those to be there in the house at the parsonage. Uh, at the church and all those men were calling because they were having a strategy meeting either in Birmingham or at pastors in Atlanta and they were wanting to make sure that our pastor was there. So I got involved at an early age and I remember asking my father if he was a registered voter and he said no and he had gone and uh, uh, to register but had been denied the right uh, to register. And he had joined with some other men who were members of the Masonic Lodge, and they would have these uh, little sessions where they were trying to prepare them. But there was nothing to prepare them for answering how many bubbles and a, uh, a bar of soap and all of these crazy questions that they had to answer. And even, you know, we learned that our, our, our college professors, men who uh, were just very, you know, knowledgeable about the Constitution and history and all this stuff. They couldn't pass the exam. And so <laughs> when I see our young people now, some of them, you know, just relax and saying it doesn't matter. And then those young people who are talking about taking over when they have not prepared themselves to take over anything. Right. That right. bothers me. When you never come to a, com a, a city council meeting, uh, you don't come to the things when we are trying to pull the community together to do those collaborative things to build community, to connect with people, because it's those connections with people that are going to make the difference. You've got to have, and that's what we had when I was growing up. You know, I, I grew up doing the mass meeting nights. You know, on Sunday nights, we went to the mass meetings and uh, got encouraged to maybe go the next week to integrate a lunch counter or the movie theater. And when you think about and you look at the history of men like uh, Dr. King and John Lewis, Dr. Vivian, if you know that story about how they all came together, 
and uh, Dr. Uh, the other gentleman that was teaching the nonviolent social action stuff. Um, they were prepared and they got better prepared for what they went out and done. And some of our people are not getting prepared and it's not all of them and some of them are, but they don't need to leave those of us who are at least 70 years old. They don't need right. to tell us that we need to get out of the way. We need to get in the way we, and we need to stay in the way and we need to do this thing together. Yeah, that, that, I you know, need the younger people, they need us. And, uh, and and together we can make this thing. We can share those stories uh, and, and, and and encourage each other and let them know that uh, we can we're in this thing together. No, yep. I've and got to fight this good fight together. Mm -hmm. You know, when we we're talking about women and uh, women uh, running for office and women uh, uh, supporting each other, uh, and we've got to do that again, just like. Uh, the women did back in the 1900s and 1800s, first century, all that stuff. This is nothing new for us. No. This is nothing new when it comes to us getting together and supporting each other through our church, through the NAACP and uh, other organizations uh, uh, that have been there and been our backbone. We don't need to throw those organizations, we don't need to throw the church, black church out with the water, the, uh, the dish water. And uh, we need to realize where we've come from and appreciate that struggle and be committed to continuing that struggle. Well, you and know, in order to do that, we've got to have that spiritual connection and we've got to have that moral connection. Right. We've got to have a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood uh, that we can carry on. We, we all need each other. Maybe. And it's, it's not going to be just any one group of people or uh, uh, what is it I mean this thing is is how things are, are happening now uh, just all over the country and we just got to not just get in where you fit in but know where you fit in and get in and help make a difference you see um this is something that I noticed um here lately I don't know if everybody has been experiencing this same thing but in our community, I've been hearing more lately the past few decades how much a waste of time it is to vote. Is that something that's been commonly been going on in Gwinnett County and in, in, in Virginia and in Talladega? Have y'all been hearing that a lot? From because I'm, I'm arguing with people all the time. I'm in the barber shop and I'm out, outnumbered sometimes, like one to nine, one to ten. I'm for voting and they calling me everything but the son of a black man for saying that we should vote. You know. Is that a, a, a big issue that y'all all are noticing beside myself, or is it just me noticing that? You know, leading up to my election, uh, that was something that I heard a lot. Uh, but since the election, like I said, we won about 23 votes. Um, you know, people can't really make that argument anymore with me um, because it literally came down to every single person that came out to vote. Uh, and so I think that's something that, you know, that's and really I don't just share. That Did somebody else say something? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, so in 2018, which was a midterm election, we pulled out double. We thought our win number was going to be around 110,000. We pulled out 154,000 votes average. And I'm going to tell you what made the difference. And this is sad. I had to put my face on the signs to let people know that a black person was running. They had never seen a black woman run. They had never seen a black woman who had been in leadership positions, um, you know, that had taken charge. Once they found out that I wasn't just a black candidate, that, you know, I had a background, um, myself and a team of people started the TSA. Um, I work for NASA. Uh, yeah, I'm a classic nerd. Right. I am the biggest nerd. Oh, we got a connection problem again. Is that people got up and they went out in the rain and voted. Now, 2020, people are afraid to leave their front door. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have that same problem coming up. I'm telling people to do this. Vote. Get out there and vote that ticket. Because we 
we don't need to be silent right now. I agree, I agree with what um, Vanjie's saying 100%. Um, people have to understand that every vote does count. Mm -hmm. And I try to impress that upon people, um, just letting them know that I am running, that I need their support. I ask for that vote everywhere I go, I ask for it um, because I can't do this alone. It's important that we do vote. I remember when um, our present president was running and my son asked me, he couldn't believe that with everything that was being said, that this person could end up becoming the president. And he's like, Mama, do you think he's going to become president? I said, if you don't get out there and vote, he will. <laughs> Absolutely. And needless to say, he didn't vote that year. And um, he saw what happened. You know, and I right. think that happened to a lot of us because a lot of us may not have wanted, you know, the other choice then. But at the same time, if you don't, you know, your vote is your voice. If you want to be silent, stay home and don't vote. Right. But uh, we can't afford that. We cannot afford it. Too much is at stake. And you're absolutely right. And one of the things I tell people, you vote when you don't vote. Oh, that's you true. Know, you, don't, you vote when you don't vote. That's right. So at least take that time and go to the poll. And, and let your voice be heard. Right. That's right. You can't just sit back and say, you know, it's not going to count. It's going to count one way or the other. So at least let it be said that you matter and that you made a conscious decision uh -huh. to not stay at home on election day, but to get out. I don't care how cold it gets, if it's too hot, too cold, too whatever get up and get to the post. That's right. That's right. I mean, would you say that um we got comfortable, got complacent, the reason why we, we um started slipping at the polls because, you know, I, I, I've been pretty, you know, pretty big on observing history, knowing, you know, what my people did before me and how we got to where we are. And um, I saw, a, a, a seems to me like a different atmosphere. Now, being that I wasn't there at that point in time, I could easily just be seeing the best pictures of everything and not realizing that there was a whole lot more lazy people out there, not out there marching during the civil rights era. But I still feel deep down inside, I feel like that there had to be some kind of comfort or relaxation that happened with us because I heard recently a female, well, a group of females tell a councilman that once they elected him, it was his place to just do his job. He, they didn't need to reach out to him anymore. And I was like, well, I see now that they really don't understand that once you get the, your person in that you want in, you still have to participate. You still have to be adamant and, and, and let them know what you want going on. And I just, you know, I'm wondering, is it just me or is it, are we comfortable? You know, what, what caused that comfort? Did integration trick us and make us feel like that we didn't have to keep fighting and, and, and paying attention to what was going on because... We've been going backwards for a certain for a certain length of time here lately. Let, let me say this, uh, Rico. I don't know at what point it, uh, we started going backwards. I don't think there's any one particular thing that, for me, that we can point at and say that, you know, because we didn't do this or because we did this. Because when we look at, you know, from the uh, civil rights era and all of the gains that we made during that time, and when we woke up one day, all of those gains were gone. Uh, and so I don't know if we got caught up in trying to still realize that American dream uh, in spite of, you know, getting an education and still having white people, men and women, make three or four times more than you, uh, that gap between uh, black and white wealth. And here we are still struggling, trying to reach up and pull up, and at the same time, all, you know, being pressed down and pushed back. And so the things that have happened in recent months, uh, with the with the Floyd case, and with all of the uh, talk about race and racism, we've been talking about systemic racism for a very long time. Right. Uh, in in the circles that I move around in. But on a large, uh, global scale, uh, those terms are not talked about. You know, we talk about uh, health and educational disparities and economic disparities and all those things. But when we come down to small communities, 
those are not the conversations that people are having. Right. So people are caught up with just trying to survive. Uh, when I, I tell you, Rico, that I can stand on my front porch and look down this long street, which is about equivalent to, um, and I'm in rural Alabama, about three city blocks. And when I was growing up, there was a mother and father in every house. When I, when I grew up, the people in the community uh, were members of the churches that were in the community. The children went to school in the community. And when I look down the street now, I don't see fathers. I don't see five or six children playing in the yard. You know, now we've got, what, two and a half kids, and I don't know how they get that one half kid in there. <laughs> but so much has changed. And uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't know where we uh, got off, but, in, but race plays a big part in that. It plays a big part in that. And, and so we can't get so excited about, well, we got the first black this, uh, we got the first black that, and, uh, and, and we're losing ground. Right. And so I, I think now where we are is that uh, we've got to reach back and try to uh, move forward. Right, right. And regain some of what we have lost. Uh, and to tell our children those stories so that they won't become so uh, complacent. Right. And uh, relaxed as we did. And look up one day and uh, that barn that, you know, uh, and, and all the cows, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that farm that you, you, you wanted to own, you know, all the cows are out of the pasture now. Right. And you've got to score it all over, so to speak. So, uh, and, you know, because uh, when I was growing up, uh, maybe I heard of one or two young men going to reform school. Uh, we would call it farmatory. You look around in the whole doggone neighborhood incarcerated, you know? Yep, yep. Uh, and then when they uh, do release you to come back, they don't give the community or the family anything to help you try to get yourself reestablished. Uh, and if you came out of the project, you can't go back into the project. And uh, I don't, uh, you know, it's just, it's just so much. Yeah. And I'm just glad that people like us who are, still have our eyes open, even though sometimes it feels like we're fighting a losing battle, but we're not. We're not. And when I heard the sister say, you know, you have history behind you, I was looking at some of the candidates for offices in the uh, adjoining cities, and uh, everybody either has a BS degree or this degree, or they worked here, they worked there. I have a problem with some black folk who think that they can just willy-nilly come and run for an office and just because they're black, you're gonna put them in office and they're gonna do some great things. And they have not had this stuff up here incubated <laughs> no kind of way. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying you need uh, to be a Phi Beta Cap and Rose Scholar and all this. If nothing else, read oh. and watch the news, watch several of them uh, so that you can be aware of what's going on and then not down your people because, you know, we got this little stuff in our communities that, you know, we're kind of anti-intellectual and we, you know, get upset when folks, you know, stop doing what we used to do. Mm -hmm. and so Call we them empathy. To, uh, we, we have to, allow, and then a lot, and a lot of us, those of us who are in office, let me be real sometimes. You know, let me be human right. because I'm still right. human. Right. You know? Right. Uh -huh. Let, 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 and stop coming to see what mistakes I'm going to make. You know, that's, that's one of the things that I, I, I would really be upset with some of the black men uh, who would talk about President Obama and how he didn't do enough. Well, I'm going to know, well, hey, how much is enough? And how much are you doing? And, and when, if he's not doing it, if he didn't do enough, why didn't you try to get to him and show him? How to help do enough. Yeah, yeah. And we hey. don't support, you know, and, and I and sisters, I know us. I know us. And when I say I know us, I know us. Hey, let me all. Um, we have to we really have to embrace each other. Yes. And lift each other. We have to straighten up each other's crowns. 
uh, I have a girlfriend over in Augusta, and I told somebody, uh, now she would be the person that would straighten out my crime. Hold up, Miss Abbott. Hold on, hold on for one second. I got to call out the phone number. I don't want this whole broadcast and they gave out the phone number for nobody to call in. If anybody wants to call in and come in on this topic that we're talking about, the telephone number is 678-381-1973. That's 678-381-1973. If you can, call in if you have any comments you want to make or anything else you want to blow the whistle about. Okay, you can go ahead. Yeah, and so, uh, I, I, and I say, you know, she's the kind that she would straighten out my crown, but she would look at me and say, damn, man, brother, how did you, you get this thing on your head like this? Uh -oh. And she would fix it. And that's what we have to do for each other, sister. Hey. How did you get this thing Ms. turned around like Ms. this? Miss Alberta. Miss Alberta. <laughs> Hey, yes. Miss Alberta, my, my 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 radio manager, he'll put you in the call up on them cuss words. <laughs> he, this is a Christian stadium, a Christian station. He'll put you in the call and he get me, he get all of us in the morning when we get to saying them words. Okay. <laughs> I, was just, I was just making a comment about, and she's a good Christian woman. She told me that's what you would say. I think you get this thing like this. Hey, I'm gonna ask. Yeah, but let's, let's, and, and I'm so glad to see us supporting each other and working uh and even if, and, and 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 being connected with uh, with each other it's just it just it means so much uh to you know and, and those are the women and men young men too uh because uh, it means a lot to have somebody in your corner somebody to help support you somebody to give you an encouraging word uh, maybe to just send you uh, a, a, a text message or something that mm -hmm. just encourages you so you know we have to we have to stay encouraged, and uh, we have to keep we just have to keep on fighting. The Good. struggle is not any time is not over. Let me ask Tim so, this. I'm gonna ask Tim a question real quick. Um, it may be just me, but it seems to me that I've been seeing a lot more women of color get involved in politics and and step up and lead the um, path that our community needs to go in. Is that the same thing you're witnessing? Mm -hmm. Definitely. You uh, see what I'm saying? You know, uh, black women make the example. Since we came here in 16, 19, all the way up to today, black women have always been the um, the backbone of our community. They make things happen. If you look at the civil rights movement, it didn't happen without black women. Mm -hmm. Look at, um, I mean, if you go back as far as Harriet Tubman, like black women are Black women are everything. They make they always make stuff happen for sure. So what 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 do we have to do to um stop number one, stop all this talk about the voting is a waste of time thing? And then what can we do to actually get more black males involved? Because um I was out campaigning the other day and I ran across one that actually he tried to run from. He saw what I was coming for. He saw me, he was trying to go ahead and make a move so he could get back in the house. I asked, <laughs> I asked him, did he vote? He said no. He said, but I need to. But, you know, you get tired of hearing that. But the, at least he said he needed to And then instead of saying that I don't play with that mess, man, like I normally hear. And I'm I'm, I'm baffled. I mean, I'm, I'm really racking my brain trying to find out what it is that we need to do as a whole. Because I actually I can't actually educate a lot of people about the, the importance of politics. But there are certain things that we do need to teach our people in our community because they don't get involved. They don't understand it. You know, most people are not going to get involved in something. I mean, think about it. They've been going to high school. The whole, the, the, when they went to high school, they studied government or history. And you see judges and politicians, you're just seeing a bunch of old white men. And this is what I thought when I was in school. Man, I'm tired of seeing about them. What they do for me? You know, the only thing that made me pay attention is the fact that I knew it was necessary. But those of right. my, my peers, they lost interest just as soon as they did was nothing that they saw that should interest them. They didn't realize the importance of it. So what is it can we do in the community to actually just reinforce that education of, of government and politics and knowing the ins and outs so they won't say all the crazy stuff that they do say to keep people from voting? How What you think about that, Ms. Patsy? Well, I think it just goes back to knowing about our history and how hard people fought for us to have the right to vote. I don't think you can take it for granted, you know, when you're seeing um, people being fire hosed and, 
you know, how the civil rights movement came about. And I think we did get comfortable after that when we're allowed to go where we want to go pretty Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. But I think we just got to re-educate everybody coming up how important it is. And I like what um, Mayor Alberta said about getting a test and being asked how many bubbles are in a bar of soap. I mean, really? (laughs) <laughs> you know, we cannot take this for granted. You know, we really have to um, remind and retrain, like um, Banji said, we got to redo this. Mm-hmm. And you can't, you know, sit back and think it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. We have to, each generation got to pick up its mantle. Right. So we have to do this. It's a nonstop, yeah. nonstop fight. You just can't take a break and say, okay, we don't want, it's over. When you know it's going to be other politicians coming along that's going to want to take back some of them rights that you just fought for. And nothing is permanent. Nothing. And I think that's the biggest thing that we get confused. A lot of people uninformed about politics think that once a law is passed that it can't get reversed or uh, another article can't be put in place to try to um, negate that law. And, I mean, I guess if you really think about it, people were hung. People, people got lynched for trying to vote, for having the audacity to want to vote or uh, even talk about it. I mean, so you, I hate to get drastic like that with our people, but I mean, it, it gets to the point sometimes where you have to tell them that. And you know what they'll still say? That was back then. Ain't nobody hanging nobody now. And so it's, it's still a hard fight. It's still a hard fight. But this is the crazy thing, Rico. When you think about it, we have to explain the what having a seat at the table really means for our community. Right, right. And is like when I was running, and I know Pastor's probably going to do the same thing. I'm in a predominantly 50 50 white black area, and black churches will allow me in. And I was so proud because I'll get up there on that pulpit and I would tell them I'm a PK. Preacher's kid. Nothing was more sad and disappointing to me than the turnout of the midterms after Obama was elected. And now I'm even more disappointed because you hear people, oh, well, I'm going to hold my comment. I got a phone call coming in. Um, Caller, what's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Tim Williams. Hey, Tim, how you doing? Hello, Tim. Oh, okay. yeah, I was just calling and I'm joining the um, 
the uh, conversation and the watching uh, Facebook as well. Okay, go ahead. I, um, I want to hear your thoughts. Well, my thoughts, um, and you're actually right, because uh, what I've done, um, what we have done in my community here in Atlanta Bush Mountain, uh, we, uh, we began our community organization again. And first, I was uh, tre not treasurer, but the um, secretary. And now I'm vice president. We lost our, our, our previous, previous vice president through um, COVID. So we're now like some vice president and we're making a whole lot of strides. I'm very, I'm very proud to really get to know how actually policy works, not just looking in and making assumptions. Go ahead. I, 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 will you finish? Did you hear me? Oh, I didn't hear that end part. I was just saying I'm, I'm happy that I have those head first into how to see how uh, policy and politics does work instead of looking from the outside in and making my assumptions this should be that way this is this way and and I can make a determination as to how I can make a contribution right it takes getting involved it definitely takes getting involved. I mean, anybody can speak from the outside looking in, but getting involved, you get more familiar with what's happening. And um, you realize it's not just that easy. It's not as easy. It takes a lot of work, footwork, and consistency, you know, at being adamant, but uh, being dedicated. I think dedication more than anything. But um, we're getting running up on right about an hour. I want to thank you, Tim, for calling in. You said you were calling from Atlanta? I guess he hung up. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, Timothy, Mr. Ragland, Mayor Ragland, Mayor McCrory of Hobson City, Ms. Gasson, future district attorney of Gwinnett County, and Ms. Virginia, Vangie Williams of Virginia. I want to thank all y'all for tuning in, and I want to um, be a guest on my show. And I also want to thank everybody that tuned in and called for giving me the support and participating in the Wilson. I want to hope y'all tune in next week at the same time. Um, hopefully, I plan on having a show about documentary filmmakers, but it's going to be a little twist to it. So, like I said, I want to thank all of y'all for tuning in, and um, hopefully y'all come and check me out again next week. Thank you. Peace. Thank you, thank you uh, Rico, and, and it's so good to meet all your other people on here. Maybe we can... Stay in touch. Oh, no yeah. problem. Which we, I really hope we can. Thank we definitely need to. Thank you so much, Rico. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting y'all. Bye-bye. 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 She gonna be mad when she sees <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, Ben McCord. I wasn't trying to knock you down or nothing like that. I was just saying, you know what I'm saying? You know, you the man and everything. You should have just been there to pick a little couple of buttons, a little stippler, you know what I'm saying? But I ain't mean to try to knock you, you know what I'm saying? You know I love you to death. <laughs> and y'all don't laugh at me. Look at that. All that gone. I got to get some work done. Hey, thank y'all for tuning in. Those of you that are tuning in, I see five or three views or whatever, so... Peace. I'm out of here. It's Coco, baby.